me, my name is Bruce, uh, Bruce Q, uh, title, dad. You know, that's it. I, I, I'm not into all the titles and all that stuff. I don't, I don't care what you call me. I just want you to have fun if we train together. That's what it's all about. I was born in McDill Air Force Base in Tampa and uh, only lived there 11 months. Then dad got shipped to Europe and from there to DC, then to there to Nebraska, then to Maryland, then to overseas to Hong Kong and then back to Tampa, then back to DC, so all over. But um, I was born not too far from where I'm at right now. I've been blessed to train with uh, really good people. Uh, I trained personally under Professor Prasis, Professor Jay, and then Professor Leon Jay as well. And you know, Professor always said the most important thing is they should be happy, right? He once said to me, he says, Bruce, you teach too much in the seminars. Says, the seminars should make them have fun. If they're not smiling, then it's not good. So that's the whole thing about it. So yeah, titles, I don't care what you call me, just have fun. That's, that's what I try to do whenever I teach. And then i would been very blessed that, that my son decided to do it. I didn't ask him to, he, he just did it on his own. And he's gotten real good. So tell him who you are. As he said, I'm his son. I'm, uh, that's, I guess, my title then. <laughs> I have to be humble because if not, he'll hit me. But um, I, um, I... His name is Chris. He yeah. didn't start with that. I didn't need... My name isn't important. It's just... <laughs> no, yeah, I guess my name is Chris, is what they've told me my whole life. Um, I've been doing martial arts kind of on and off since I was born. I mean... I obviously have no memory of this, but when I was two, he always told me that my patty cake wasn't the standard one. My patty cake was Cinewali forms and hand trapping and stuff like that. Yeah, empty hand Cinewali a lot. And then I started in around 72, 73. Started first at Judo in an Air Force base in Nebraska and then moved to Hong Kong and started in, in Tibetan White Crane Kung Fu. Did that for about four years there and then when we came back stateside, I shouldn't tell the story. God, my dad would be so mad if he was alive. He was so mad at me. I was sitting in, uh, I was 82-ish, and I was sitting in college reading Black Belt Magazine instead of going to class. And uh, I was reading about this guy who would just travel all over teaching people. And he said, I don't care what rank you've had. I don't care. Because I, I was young, I had an ego, I said, man, I'm, not, I'm never going to start over, I'm already so good, right? And he goes, I don't care what it is, I'm going to show you the art that's already within your art. And so I read this article, and it was about Remy Prasis in Black Belt Magazine. And the next day I called my dad, said, Dad, yeah, I'm dropping out of school. So, and uh, yeah, that didn't go well, because I was the first male of our family to go to college. Um, and. Uh, his brother, he and his brother went, but his brother finished. So I he, did, and I did he, martial arts. He's up there, yeah. Unfortunately, like father, like son. Oh huh? my god, yeah. Uh, anyway, so I moved to California to go because I looked in the back of Black Belt Magazine back then. It had all the addresses of the schools, and it said um, American Arnis Association, which was two of Remy's students, Michael Rapogel and Jeff Arnold, and but it was listed as Remy's school. So I didn't know that he didn't have a school. Much later I found out, I asked him one time why he didn't have a school and he said because it limits the number of people he can touch. But he had different schools throughout the country that were his like home bases. That area, that's where he'd be in that area. So I dropped out of school and went to California to go find him. And then at that time my Kung Fu teacher had actually moved from China to Los Angeles. So by the day I worked at a Chinese restaurant, I would wake up and do Kung Fu with him and uh, work at the restaurant. And then when I got off, I would drive two hours to North Hollywood to go train our niece and then come back to the restaurant. And I slept on two chairs that were full uh, out. Then it would start all over again. But the training was great. I mean, it was unbelievable. You're 20 something years old and you're, you're training, it's like in the movies or something. See, I'm yet. See, instead that he is doing also, I'm doing total, I'm here. And, uh, go ahead. and I'd, I'd see Professor back and forth, we were in between stops, but I trained mostly the beginning with two of his black belts. And then um, a good seven to 
10 years, maybe eight, in between when I saw him again for any length of time. Um, <clears throat> in Orlando, there used to be a place called East Coast Martial Arts, run by a guy named Bob Elder, super great dude. And that was the go-to place in Orlando for martial arts. Everybody would go there every day to hang out, right? They, and one of the magazine racks, he had nothing but seminar flyers and stuff like that. And one day, somebody said, hey, didn't you do stuff from Remy Price? I said, yes. So he's going to be in St. Pete. I said, no kidding. So I grabbed the flyer and I drove to St. Pete. And then uh, I sat there waiting in the benches in front of their, it was at a karate school. And I'm sitting there waiting and he walked in and he saw his mouth open. He freaked out. Bruce, you know, because he was amazing. He could remember, he should have been a politician. He could remember everybody's name. So we reconnected in probably early 90s. And then he, when he moved here, we trained every day. Because he wanted to live here because it was humid, hot, and nasty. And he goes, this is like home, right? So that's, that's what he was trying to do. Not the art. I knew nothing about the art. Uh, honestly, I'm the dumbest guy there is that comes to FMA. Because for the longest time, it's only till recently he started getting me out. I only knew what Remy Price has taught me. I didn't know the names of stuff. I didn't know the names of the different systems. I mean, people gave me books to read because I didn't under, they'd start talking about this, this, and I was watching somebody's black belt test. I was invited to sit on it and I didn't know what they were talking about. Because they'd give all these names. I, because he wouldn't call him by name. He'd hit me and say, now you do that. Okay, I didn't know what it's called. So what attracted me wasn't the style, it was the man. I wanted to follow this guy everywhere. Because he was just, he was so, and again, he said, look. And that's why when I met Grandmaster Tabata, it was like, man, cut from the same cloth. When he said, if you want to put Muay Thai in it, then that is your balloon to walk. If you want to put this, right? And that was that was awesome because Professor Prices was like that. It didn't matter where you came from. He said, don't throw that knowledge away now that you got it. But once I found Filipino martial arts, it was, it was the best thing in the world. I, I tell you why I like it. One um, is because I don't care what art you already do. It will make you better at it because the drills Unfortunately, we have people today that, that think that drill is fighting. And then you get the you know, YouTube ninjas and internet warriors who say, I won't work in the ring and that stuff. But it's not supposed to, it's, it's an attribute builder. They build speed, kinesthetic awareness, power, transitioning, footwork, better than any system that I've seen. And, I, and I'm not trying to be, that system's better than this system. I'm not saying that, I don't wanna get in that argument, but. The Filipino martial artists, because of the flow and because of their ability to transition better, use both hands. I mean, they just you become better. I don't care what martial art you do. If you practice FMA, you will be better at it. The other thing I think is there's a missing link between a lot of martial arts. So we call it uh, a dynamic influence of force. I mean, if you, if you see the traditional, one of my favorites, and this is not a slam, please is one of the Taekwondo one steps, right? The guy steps out right? <clears throat> and he throws the punch and then the guy does a side kick, reverse or spinning side kick, right? Well, wh what happens if you hit him with the first side kick? He'd never be there for the second one. I, I never understood that. Are you so you're planning to miss, right? So you go from static, then you go to this one step, which has no basis in real sparring, really, if you think about it. And then you spar. And what's the typical sparring in, in in dojos and schools across America. Okay guys, tonight's sparring class. Everybody get your gloves on? All right, good. Touch gloves, bow, ready, go. That's not a class. Who's teaching anything? They're just, right? Th that's what I see. But FMA teaches and bridges that gap because they teach you how to go from a static to a, to a dynamic motion. If I grab his wrist, he knows what to do. It does a wrist lot, right? But can you do it from movement? Very rarely do, do martial arts systems do that. And with the Aikido that I've seen, it's very good. But for you to be that proficient, you got to do it for 10, 15 years. 
you guys all know we can take somebody in the FMA, have them do some, some broad and a couple of other drills in 15, 20 minutes. And he'll have an understanding or that person, he or she will have an understanding of what to do. So I love the fact that FMA builds a bridge between stationary and full contact with a wide range of, for lack of a better term, the force continuum. You can go up and down the scale very easily. And, and, and you watch the guys that are really, really good. Bobby Tawada, Remy Price, Danny Inosanto. And the two things I tell my students, one is watch them from the waist down. I got that from Sugar Ray Leonard, Marvin Hagler, and Tommy Hearns. They're always in perfect balance. Their center of gravity is good. Footwork is good. They move just enough, right? Truly great masters of their craft make it look easy. Uh, Bruce Lee coined the phrase, right, economy of motion. But then one of my students also added, they have economy of motion, but they also have efficiency of action. And that's, the, and, I, and I think the FMA gives that to people. So the other thing is, you get a guy that studies, pick, give me a style of Filipino, of Balintawak, walk right? and modern Arnis. Even though they're very similar, they, the patterns are different. Yet, if they're good, they'll flow with each other. They just will. Yet, a karate guy and a, World, Tri World Taekwondo Federation guy can't do that. Well, you can't punch the face, and you can't kick to the head, you know. It, they can't do it unless they spar and, and then there's somebody who could get hurt. They're, they can't train the same way. And those two people from the two different FMA systems will still get, my biggest beef was the whole, is the whole system thing anyway. Wally Gay said there's only like a dozen techniques in the world. That's what he told me. He said everything else is just a variation. You know, then people have argued with me, wow, but this system holds the punch this way, this one holds the punch this way, and this one holds it this way, so they're different. Not really, you know, just, uh, I, I, there's only so many ways to hit somebody with a stick, right? I mean, you really have what, diagonal, diagonal, horizontal, horizontal, straight and a poke. It's really, it's just how you combine that, and I think, the FMA, I get really excited when I talk about it because I really love it. Now that I've immersed myself in it, the ability to flow, unlike a lot of the other martial arts. This is what makes the throw happen. Everybody look at this hand. This doesn't do it. Well, I was a teacher first. I taught kickboxing and uh, what we called American karate, which was basically boxing from the waist up and we taught through science and not traditionally. An example is in, in, in I'm going to get hate mail now probably, but so traditional I, Kung Fu, I stood in a horse stance and punched like this, right? This is low, middle, high, right? Well, a low punch, when you punch this way, now, can you lift more weight this way or this way? This way, correct? Because the bicep functions better when the palm faces it. That's science. That's why a boxer punches to the body this way. If you look in the old John L. Sullivan days of boxing, how did they stand? Look familiar? It evolved to here through science. We know that through biomechanics and physiology, why does a quarterback throw a ball from here better? Because the implement you're using has to be closest to the muscle group that originates the action. Science. So that's how we taught the Christ. So I was a teacher first, and then I fell in love with the FMA, and then professor told me to teach. That's why I taught. I was uh, teaching at one of his camps in Atlanta, and I said, Professor, <clears throat> I don't think I can do it. He says, why? He says, because I'm going out there and there's all these people that are higher rank than me, I don't want to screw up. He said, I teach them to do, I teach you to teach. So I did, and you know, then, then it started, and then he would arrange seminars for me and stuff like that. So, that, I mean, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't teach. And then, and then the other person that was very important to me in doing that is, was Wally J. He, he encouraged me to teach a lot. Then after Professor passed away, I didn't do it anymore, I stopped. And then his, Wally's son, Leon, and then my good friend Jack Hogan told me they wouldn't let me stop because I wasn't gonna do it anymore. Uh, it's still, I think about him a lot. I tell you, with, with that seminar with Grandmaster Tabata brought back a lot of memories. That was, that was great. Well, that's not the style. I teach modern Arnis. That was just our organization. And again, I, I, I can't tell you how much I don't want to do this. 
right? But after Professor Price has died, people called, Bruce, what do we do? I said, oh, the same damn thing you did yesterday. Well, I don't care. But we, well, we had, what do we do with that organization? I said, fine. Do whatever you did yesterday. Because they had all these splinter groups. All everybody said, they're the true heir. They're the... So, but Jack told me, he said, you got to have an organization so that people know what to do. I said, all right, fine. So that was just, that was shortly after Professor passed. I, I it was probably around 2000, 2001. So right about that time after he passed, I, I went to California to go <clears throat> stay with Leon for about, I don't even remember how long. Just because I was going through some rough spots in my life. Uh, my father just passed away. My godfather just passed away. And my teacher just passed away. So, you know, I just wanted to, to be away. So Leon said, hey, look, I'm going to go see Pops in, in California. Why don't you come out and hang with us for a while? So I said, okay. So I go out to California. <laughs> I'll never forget this. So they come pick me up. Professor J. Wally is driving, and then Leon is, is in the back seat in his van. And Mrs. J. Bernice is in the front seat. <clears throat> Open the door put in my luggage and she looks at me and if looks could kill, I'd have had one right between the eyes. He goes, who are you and why are you here? And I'll never forget because Leon goes, mom. And he goes, no, I'm serious. Why are you here? I said, ma'am, I don't understand. He says, well, this week alone, we've had the true successor to modern Arnice, the heir of modern Arnice, the successor and heir of modern Arnice, and the heir apparent to modern Arnice, all trying to get Wally's endorsement. Why are you here? I said, ma'am, I don't know nothing about those people. I don't want nothing to do with those people. I'm just here to have fun with Leon and Norm. And then Wally goes, Bernice, this is Remy's guy. Be quiet. <laughs> and, 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 um, but yeah, because right after he died, everybody was trying to get Wally's endorsement. Uh, after because they had, did all the seminars together and and I didn't I didn't like I said I wasn't didn't do it anymore I was just I was just hanging out the last two days of the trip but Leon said look pops called he wants you to teach Friday night I think it was Friday night I said what do you mean this at the home dojo I said, what do you mean he says come teach at the home dojo I said Leon I don't have I bring my crap I don't have any it doesn't matter so when Professor Wally Jay, the head of small circle jiu-jitsu, says, I want you to teach a class at his school, I'm going to go teach a class at his school. So here I am, and, and some of the top guys in small circle there, like there was a ninth Don there, and Professor Jay, and Mrs. Jay, and Leon. So I said, oh, what the hell am I going to do? So I really like small circle, and I like the, the way Professor Price has integrated a lot of, without knowing it, integrated a lot of what Wally taught, and what Wally did was make things so much easier to teach. <clears throat> he has these things called the 10 principles of small circle jiu-jitsu. I said, okay, I'm going to do a seminar on the 10 basic principles of small circle jiu-jitsu and how they relate to Arnis, because it's all about lever, fulcrum, and base, and, and a stick is a big lever. So I taught this class there, and, and it was pretty cool because, you know, this is the same floor that Bruce Lee sweat on and bled on and trained on with uh, Professor Jay. So that, that's probably one of the highlights of my martial arts career is teaching there. That was, that was pretty cool. Moving on. But my center is still here. For me, it's a student. Teaching's easy for me. I mean, I've been, I, that's, I believe that that's my gift. But being a student was harder for me because sometimes my brain doesn't track the same way other people's do. Uh, we're a mixture of auditory, kinesthetic, uh, kinesthetic and um, visual learners. All of us are a combination of those three. Um, some are more kinesthetic, some are more visual. Like, I know guys, if you give them a manual, they can read it and do it. I'm not one of those guys. I can't. You gotta walk me through it and then I'm still gonna have problems. Some guys, you can hear, they can, you can give them directions, fold A into B, then fold D into C, and they'll do it. I can't even figure out what D is. So yeah, I, definitely being a student for me. And, and I also think being a teacher is more rewarding. Because as a teacher, I'm still a student, and I know that's cliche, but I try to tell people, if I show you something in a seminar on a Saturday, you gotta teach it to two people by Tuesday. Because it really reinforces your learning, and it helps you see what things you need to do to correct it. Because people are all different sizes, you know, six foot, I have one student's like six five, he does things different than I do because of the, the, the leverage and the, and the way he is. I would like to say 
I hope to think that it evolves to what Professor would have wanted, because um, some things we have changed and some things we do differently now and in the teaching. So I'll be honest, <clears throat> even with him, I don't hit people as hard as he hit me. I don't. Well, unless uh, Willie Matthias said it the best. Um, he said, all you guys that the professor trained are, are really good, but you're soft. And I admit it. He goes, he says, and, and that's not meant to be an insult. What I mean is, although he taught you very well and you guys are very good, you have to understand when we were in the Philippines as children, we got hit hard every day. And it was, this guy was scrawny. His arm was like the size of that tripod, but it was like rebar. I mean, he blocked the stick, like, you know, you think he was, and nothing would hurt him, but he got hit every day. We don't do that here. He would quit. They'd go to the, you know, the Mac Dojo up the street. So we have changed certain things. Because the way he taught me, for example, one of our, our drills, I didn't know we were doing a drill. I'd go to his house, he'd pick up a stick, and we would start going. This would go on for a couple months, and then one day he said, he invited another buddy of mine named Jeff up. He goes, okay. And he sat down, grabbed his water, and said, today you are me, you teach him. I said, teach him what? What the hell are you talking about? He says, what do you think we've been doing for the last couple of months? I said, I don't know. <laughs> he goes, teach him. I just stood there dumbfounded. I didn't know what he wanted. And then I realized we were doing the same pattern over and over and over again. And I tried to do it with him. I said, wait, this isn't right. Ah, it's because the professor was always left-handed when he was doing this. So I put the stick in my left hand and, I, and slowly, and that's how I learned it. So, you know, obviously I don't teach it that way. We all, okay, everybody do this, this, this. But at first he just started coming at you. And then it's okay. You got it? I'm going, got what? I, I'm Cause you know, you're just trying not to get crushed. I remember I asked him one time, I said, this is really cool, but what would you do if it was real? That was a big mistake. <laughs> we were in his apartment in celebration and he, we'd just been doing a six, eight, 12, a, th a six count drill. <clears throat> with Paulus Paulus and he put the stick he says first I would be this because I am left-handed so he put the stick in his left hand he says you attack so I blasted him he took the stick blocked it choke slammed me right out of WWE I mean, his right hand shot right to my throat swept my leg choke slammed me to the ground <clears throat> I had hair and I just went <clears throat> right there and moved my hair and he goes if this was real you are dead that's exactly I said okay I mean, tell you, that sphincter factor was off the chart, Bubba. I was so scared. Yeah. Um, so I never said, yeah, never did that again. But because he understood the difference between playing and fighting. Do you know of any successful modern art, or a successful Filipino martial arts school in the country, standalone, that doesn't teach another art? Do you know what my, my I have a philosophy for a reason for why there is no successful. Because in America with the karate schools, the taekwondo schools, even the kung fu schools now have a sash system. Look, I grew up in that. They didn't have belts in China, right? They had string to hold up your pants. And the first question people from other arts ask me, what's your curriculum? I don't know. And that's what I've noticed with, because really the way the Filipino martial arts seems to be when I've worked with people is, They'll show you something. You might not see that for a year. It isn't, okay, by, in your first 39 lessons, you have to do this, 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 and this. Like in a Taekwondo school, well, by lesson four, you know that at 13 degrees, your toe needs to be pointed in this stance. Well, we don't do any of that stuff because it's just flowing. And the teacher today may go, you know what? Ah, we're not going to do that. I thought of something different on the way in. And they just do it. And you have fun. It's great. But if you notice, there is no this to get to this, this to do this, and this to do that. And you're, by this time, you're going to do this, and on this day, we're going to do this. It's, just, it's more just flowing, which I think is better anyway. Everybody has to learn the basics this way first. Uh, I'm real big on basics, correct fundamentals, footwork, teaching the pivot. Three things have to happen for the upper body to strike efficiently. I don't care if it's a baseball, tennis ball, or someone's head shift, torque, and follow through. Has to happen, right? 
some people forget that. So I think fundamentals are, so we try to, we try to stick to that. But yeah, that's, that's the difference. As a kid, everyone says their father could beat up, you know, my dad could beat up your dad. It was funny that I could always say, well, I know my dad could beat up your dad. That was never a thought in my mind that my dad would lose. But um, I don't want to say that I necessarily grew up in, I mean, my parents, they split when I was very little. So I didn't really get to train with them as much as I would have liked to, I think. I was five when, when I got divorced from his mother. I was five, you were five. Oh, yeah, 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 right, sorry. Yeah, that would have been weird. You know what I mean, he was five. So he'd done a lot of the trapping hand stuff when he was little and the patty cake, but five, I left. Um, so. And then when I was around nine or 10, I really wanted to get into martial arts. I mean, I, I, I had worn his shirts, I had worn small circle shirts throughout my childhood. So I'd always known these things existed, but I didn't know much about them. You know, I thought the best martial artists in the world were Bruce Lee and my dad. Those, those were the only two I knew about. So then I wanted to do martial arts, and the two options in my area was a very well-renowned renowned Kung Fu school, Walam Temple, and a Taekwondo school. And my mom asked him, What's, what do you think? I did Taekwondo for 10 years, uh, first five, and then I got my black belt, and I was a teacher there. I started teaching when I was like 12 or 13, essentially. Was teaching all throughout that time there, and then when I got my first black belt is when he actually said, all right, Chris, now I'll take you to seminars. He didn't really train me officially until I was 15. And, you know, we talked about it much later because he's like, and I finally understood it because at the time I was like, well, why didn't my dad teach me first? Why didn't I learn stick stuff in the very beginning? And the respectful answer was that he didn't, well, two reasons. One, he didn't want me to completely ignore what my sensei was teaching me in the Taekwondo school and just completely throw it out the gar in the garbage. But two, because I didn't know what I was doing. The fundamentals were terrible because I was brand new. And my father knew he could teach me best from a place of understanding that I already had. If my footing was wrong, he would say, all right, do it like a front stance, but turn it 45 degrees. Oh, okay. Do it like a horse stance, but shorten it by this amount and do it this way. Oh, okay. So, I mean, I didn't really think of this as a future necessarily. I thought it was just fun and... God, I don't want it to be his future. I want to get a real <laughs> job. Be a doctor or a lawyer. No, but I... but in all fairness, we're not the type of family that says, hey, Dad, let's go play catch in the yard. That was, we, that was stupid for us. We hated baseball. <laughs> we're the whole, hey, let's get gloves on and see what we can do. You know, he'd whoop me something fierce every now and again, or I'd grab a stick and I'd get, thought I was a little faster and he'd hit me in the head with a stick. That's, that, was, that was how I learned. I didn't want to force martial arts on him, so I never talked about him doing martial arts. And I didn't, I wanted him to, I strongly believe, I don't care what art you are, get a black belt in it. So at least you have some understanding of that, because that's when you really can learn. I was never afraid of getting hit by a stick. Okay. Well, you know, he was a natural <laughs> at it, I, and I'm, I'm not kidding. He would, we would go, when he was four, we'd go to the, the East Coast Martial Arts Store. Like I said, everybody hung out there. For some reason, he would immediately go to the, where the, umbrella stand full of rattan sticks are. I'll never forget the manager of the store, a guy named Carl, great Kung Fu guy, um, Wing Chun. He, he, uh, he grabbed a stick and Carl goes, oh, try to be like your dad. Quam! And he smashes him on the hand. <laughs> Get started. So Carl being Carl, you know those big Taekwondo gear bags? He put him in the bag so only his head was out and then hung him on the ceiling. <laughs> Off the backhand stretch or the entry three version of the MG3. Not to sound like a broken record, but I also know teaching is something that I'm blessed with. Like, I've had my father as a great example of teaching martial arts, but I've also worked in ministry work where I've been teaching other people, I've been teaching kids. I have did the math this recently. I've been teaching more than half my life. I'm 25 now. I started teaching when I was 12. I've been teaching for, you know, a long time for a 25 year old. It's not that long, but for me, it's a long time. <laughs> because it's all I've really done. That's been most of my careers have been, whether teaching karate, teaching children's fitness, teaching martial arts, volunteering in ministry work. Like I've been teaching and surrounding myself with great teachers because I've always believed that, I think it's one of the, the perks of martial arts and what a lot of people don't understand is why I tell parents to definitely put their kids, because they ask all the time, when should my kid do martial arts? As soon as they're able to. Because it humbles me naturally. I was never that 16 year old who thought I was invincible. I always knew I could get my ass kicked because I got it kicked, 
pretty, I was always in the adult sparring class getting beat up by all the adults. So I always learned relatively quick that if I don't know something, I should ask someone who's further down the line than me. So when it was a martial arts question or when I had a, a few martial arts political situations happen to me personally, first person I called was him. Because I know he's been around that scene a whole lot more and said, Dad, first question I asked was, well, I asked him, or I told him the whole story with as much non bias as I could and I'd say, Dad, what did I do wrong? What did he do wrong? And sometimes it was me. Sometimes it was them. Sometimes it was a mixture of the two and we both didn't see it. And that taught me a lesson there. When I had less, when I had to learn how to be a better communicator, I would talk to a mentor friends of mine who were pastors who did that stuff for a living of communicating and relationing, relating to people. I've always surrounded myself with good teachers because I want to be a better teacher. I don't think teaching is something you ever stop being good at. I think teaching is something you continue to be better at than you were before. So I know my teaching has only gotten better. I don't think I've, not to sound cocky or arrogant, that I haven't been a bad teacher at times. I know I've messed up a few things, but I know I've only gotten better since when I started. I don't think I've taken steps back because I constantly watched him, watched two on Ray Dinaldo, Leon, Professor Leon Jay, you know, that's another Jack. great thing about this. Because of him being who he is, I've been able to have a lot of these uncle figures in my life who teach me things. Grandmaster Bram Frank, Uncle, you know, Ray Dinaldo, Guru Chad Bailey, Grandmaster Jack Hogan, Professor Leon Jay, Guru Eric McGee of Orlando Escrima, who's been a phenomenal mentor to me in navigating this startup that I've been trying to get in Orlando, Florida. I really can't fail because I have so many great examples to follow. You know, it's not like I'm trying to do everything on my own because then I know I'd fail. You know, left to my own devices, I'm an idiot. And I think I get that from him sometimes, but. <laughs> I'll tell you another thing about the FMA that's so different. Other martial arts that I've been involved with. I remember I was competing at the NASCAR tournament and a guy came up to me and says, how come you don't show respect? I said, what are you talking about? He says, you don't bow to my student. I said, what do you mean? He, he points to his pack. He says, this is real Chinese Kung Fu. Why do you not bow? I said, look at his face. This is a real Chinese man. <laughs> but you don't see that in the FMA. Not as much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But generally, everybody welcomes you. Look, we're, two of us go down to the seminar. Hey, you'd think we've been friends with June for 25 years. The first thing he did was give us a hug. That's right, I just met him. I mean, it was amazing how, how friendly people were down there. It was great. They're so welcoming. No egos. The egos were gone. Everybody's just playing. Let's do this. Let's do that. Well, let's eat. There's always a lot of eating, so I love that. Yeah, they're just so open and so friendly. You, you, you know, <clears throat> it's funny. Grandmaster, Rami Prices, right? Sometimes the Taekwondo school wouldn't want him. You know, uh, I met a Korean guy in, in, in uh, Georgia who explained it to me this way. He goes, you know, they're afraid. I'm not afraid. You, I want you to teach a seminar here. I want to give my students more knowledge. How can you steal them? You don't even live in Georgia. You're 900 miles away. I, you can't steal them. But because they're afraid, because they're insecure. I'm not. Uh, he was so open and so friendly. I said, are you sure you're Korean? No, I should not. I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to get in trouble. I'm just a joke. It's a joke. And so I, with these types of jokes, I've also learned what to say and what not to say as a teacher. See? I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I'm letting him make his mistakes so he can tell me what not to do. Yeah, sometimes, uh, and, and this is, it sounds corny, but I believe it. You know, the FMA, I always think of the F means family. Because they're so open wherever I've gone. And then they've treated him really well, too. And so anybody like, like Eric, for example, anybody that treats my son good, well, you know, if you're a parent, you know, that's a big deal. So, yeah, it's, it's been... It's been a hell of a ride, and he's the last couple of years has really been since I moved back to Florida. Come on, Dad, let's go. We're gonna go this weekend to see somebody. I don't know who, but we're going. So um, that's because people try to message you, and they don't realize you, you don't use social media. Yeah. Guru Chad Bailey said it best in an interview that someone was talking about. I said, if you want to get a hold of Bruce, talk to Chris. Several, several years ago. He calls me on the phone. I was still living in D.C. He was living in Orlando. He goes, Dad, do this. did you see what they said on YouTube? I said, no. 
granted this YouTube video was also from six years prior. I didn't even it was know. Very yeah, old. yeah. Some guy put all of my DVDs on on YouTube. I, I, I said, what, why? He says, well, he's blasting, he's saying this won't work, and this is that, and this is this, this, this. So, so, but he's going, why don't you respond? Why? And I, because I don't care what he thinks. Yeah, you say that then. And I said, what? Feel free, come to some. No, you were much more hostile than that. I, I deleted both of your comments, that's why I know it was hostile. Then there's no proof. I'm not hostile. What did you say, Dad, at one point, Chris? I've lived longer than I've got left. What are they going to do to me? Yeah, I don't care anymore. See, you figure it. When you get to a certain age, right? You get to a certain age when you have less time on the planet than you've lived, right? He's got his whole life in front of him. My whole life's behind me. So who cares? What are they going to do? They put me in jail for 20 years. I might not live at 15, right? The average expectancy is 77, 77 years old. So in June, that means I only have 20 years left. What are they going to do? What the hell? I don't care. So how we have, how we handle these internet ninjas is with a, a good dose of sarcasm and cynicism. That's what gets us through our days. Yeah, I, I don't pay them too much attention. I don't. I, I, and I, but all kidding aside, <laughs> uh, and I'll say this, I don't know, you know, um, on face chat, gram, inner, inner book, whatever, they're all, anybody has a problem, come to the seminar. Because maybe I am wrong. I'll say that I, I, I don't, look, I just try to teach what professor taught me. I'm nowhere as good as he was. <laughs> Dude, if he's a whole hand, I'm the pinky fingernail. That's it. He, so I may be wrong. I, when what I said might be, then show me and let me learn a new way. That's really what it is. So come show me. Uh, or I read it, actually. An old proverb says, you're only a master when you have no more questions. I ain't never going to be a master because I got questions every damn day. I have none. I just like to go play and train. And the more I hang out with everybody else like Chad and Bram and, and Ray, I just like having fun. But uh, I, I remember what Professor said, you know, it limits the number of people I can touch. So the more people I can show his stuff to, that's it. Just make the family grow. If, if someone can take one little, it's like sprinkles on your ice cream, right? If I can just give them one sprinkle and it makes their stuff better, that's awesome. That's it. And that's done. Just one nugget. That's all you need. You don't have to become a student. You don't have to train your life in modern East. Don't stop what you're doing. But maybe we can give you one little sprinkle that'll make your training better at this or better at that. That's it. That's my goal. So coming off the same way, going really slow first. Honestly, it, it's to further the ideals and art of Remy Prices. So I'm, I, I really believe in mission statements and vision statements. So I, I work, I'm an, my real day job is I'm an advocate for uh, disadvantaged and homeless people, mostly home, uh, work with disadvantaged vets. And one of the things I want them to do is develop a, a personal mission statement and vision. Right, because if you don't know where you're going, you can't get there. And then, for me personally, to make sure that every person that trains with us leaves with a smile. He was very, it was very important. Be happy. You must have fun. He would tell me that all the time. So my personal mission statement is: every day, I want to learn something new. I want to help someone, and I want to laugh. I'm gonna laugh my ass off at least one time during the day. Belly laughing, puke till you know, that type, tears in your eyes. Cause, and if you can accomplish those things, that's a good day. So I wanna try to put that into what we do. I wanna make sure that they learn something. I wanna make sure that they have fun and that it has helped them become a better martial artist. What's your take on it? Next generation. If I'll be like Professor, it will be yours. Everything he said, but I'm going to add a few parts to it. You know, obviously, yes, we want to further and share the ideals of Professor Prasus, but you too. You know, you've shared a lot with a lot of people, and you also have a voice that is different than professors. People have told me that. It's, you know, a lot, you guys say a lot of the same things, but you have a different way about it. You know, you also are up there. Your ideals need to be shared just as much. You know, I share this with everybody now. One of the quotes he taught me since 
I really, since I started teaching it whenever I was 15, 13, whatever, one of the first pieces of advice he ever taught me, you know, he doesn't want to be the world champion. He wants to train the world champion. And that's how I've been teaching all of my students since that day. And I want all of my students to teach their students that way. Because I heard this from an old karate guy. He says, you know, wisdom is the only fun thing about getting old. That's what all these old timers tell me. I'm an old timer now. Listen to this smart ass. You know, the other thing about, uh, 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 about teaching that is, is so good is, right? I mean, it just, a teacher is different than an instructor. And I'm not saying that semantically, in my eyes. A teacher is someone who gives of himself. So every time I teach, I, I give a little bit of myself with, with you. Uh, hopefully you like it. If you don't, that's okay too. I mean, there's, they make red cars and blue cars for a reason. Some people like red, some people like blue. Uh, you may not like what I teach. Well, that's cool. But at least you took, you, you took the time to check it out yourself. And I appreciate that. I respect that. Um, there's, a, there's a thing you always said, and this is one, you know, some of the political things I had to deal with is, really helped me with this. With what you said was every teacher strives, every good martial arts teacher strives for their students to one day surpass them. If the, t if the instructor, if the chief instructor, if whoever's in charge of this system or organization doesn't want their students to be better than them, they're going to be failures. Yeah, I want, every st I want my students to be better than me. That's their opportunity. Because hopefully they'll learn from my mistakes. You know, my father once said, right, a smart guy learns from his mistakes, a wise man learns from the other person's mistakes. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I want that. I want to help them uh, and, and, and jump start them. If, if 10 years of my learning can be five years of his learning, he's five years ahead of the game. So I want my students to be better than me. Every one of them. That'd be kick ass. I mean, that'd be, that'd be it.